Good morning, First Church. What a beautiful Sunday morning it is for you to join us. Let's stand together and lift our voices in worship.
door Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roll Up from the ashes Hope will by one of our members that God can use whoever he wants to use because that's God he may use somebody you don't like to get to you somebody that bought or earned doesn't have a blue check beside their social media He's, he can use anybody to get to you and in my life I think about the people that have spoken Jesus over me all the tired mamas and grandma any tired moms or grandmoms in the audience today or is it just me <laughs> All of those women in my life that when I couldn't spoke the name of Jesus over my family and spoke it over my marriage and over my children and over my house and over my job. And, you know, sometimes we don't realize what speaking the name of Jesus, because it all bears fruit. Amen, Pastor? It bears fruit. And you think about the effort that you put into continually being consistent with your love and your encouragement with your family and speaking Jesus over them, maybe even while you're packing lunches. I try to, I'm not always perfect at it, but I just think about, you know, there was that one mom in the Bible who son came home and said, Mom, I met somebody today and I shared my lunch with him. And she's thinking, he probably didn't even eat it when I packed it this morning, right? Because that's what I'm thinking on a weekly basis. And he says, his name was Yeshua. And mommy took my lunch. 
and he fed thousands because she was speaking into his life and she was speaking Jesus over his life and she was there and consistent and faithful like our God always is for us. She was used. Her efforts were bearing fruit. So what I'd encourage you to do this morning is think about all those people in your life. Like I had a praying grandmama, I'm so thankful, and a praying mother who consent, continues to pray over us and me. That one that may have prayed that that drug addiction would cease and that prodigal would come home or that marriage would mend or that that dollar in your wallet may turn into a hundred so that you could pay your bills. But there are people in your life when you do not know are speaking Jesus over you. And so this morning I want you to think about that humbly and with gratitude and I want you to worship with us as Laura Beth leads us.
the name above all names. You will send fear and anxiety away. You can heal us, give us peace, protect us, and hold us steadfast. God, we humbly come with gratitude this morning as an opportunity to worship and be thankful that we can speak your name above all names, and it is done. We are so grateful for everything that you have done, God, not only in our lives, but in this place. So we will stand on faith for everything we know that you will continue to do. In that name of all names, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. First Church, before you sit down, turn around, and why don't you do me a favor? Say hello to somebody maybe you don't know or haven't seen in a while, and pass the peace of Christ. While we do that, let's dismiss our kids right here at the front. All of our littles, our first kids this morning. All of our littles this morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good for us to be together uh, this morning as Jesus shared on that Mount of Transfiguration with his disciples. And they said, Lord, it is so good for us to be here with you. Glory and I enjoy being in the bridge, and it's just wonderful to worship together uh, this morning. We want to connect with you in our quest to grow in our faith, our discipleship together. There's a QR code on the screens. If you scan it, it will take you to FUMCT link where you will be able to see all of the ministry opportunities here at the church that we can grow in our faith. Also, there's a link that will take you to a page for giving. We're going to be talking about that in this new series, Recalculating, and today what happens when we give, and when we give, we're able to expand our ministry here at First United Methodist Church, Tuscaloosa, as the hands and feet of Jesus. Wednesday Night Alive, every Wednesday night, we invite you to come and be a part of Wednesday Night Alive. Uh, dinner is at 5 p.m., uh, then at 6 o'clock p.m., small groups, classes, opportunities for us to grow in our faith together. Also, as you leave today, if you haven't done so already, there are baskets at each door, offering baskets at each door, and please share your offering uh, today so that we can continue the ministry of Jesus Christ here at First Church Tuscaloosa. God bless you. Amen. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. We continue today our series that we commenced on the first Sunday, recalculating the high and the why of giving, which we will continue through next Sunday. And uh, hopefully this has been very helpful uh, to you as we look at how and why we give for the kingdom of God and for our purposes through uh, First United Methodist Church for the ministries here to grow God's kingdom. 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses 6 through 8, will be the basis of our thinking together this morning. 
And what I want to do is take three versions and combine them into one. I want to take a piece from each version, and that would be the basis for our scripture this morning. I want to look at the Tree of Life version, the Common English Bible, and the Contemporary English version. The Apostle Paul says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Everyone should give whatever they have decided in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation or because of pressure, for God loves a cheerful giver. God can bless you with everything you need, and you will always have more than enough to do all kinds of good things for others. And from those verses, I want us to focus on the thought, what happens when we give? What happens when we give? Friends, the Apostle Paul is a prominent personality in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul originally Saul from Tarsus, which is modern day Turkey. As Saul, he is from the Jewish tribe of Benjamin. As Saul, he is a Pharisee and a Roman citizen who persecute those who belong to the way, the early Christ followers, the church. As Saul, he studies the Hebrew scriptures, the law in Jerusalem under the rabbi Gamaliel, the Pharisee doctor of the Jewish Mosaic law. As Saul, because of his anti-Christian zeal, he does everything he can to stop the growth of Christianity. As Saul, he ravages the church, enters the homes of Christians, and force, and by force, put them into prison. As Saul, you remember how he holds the garments, holds the cloaks of the executioners as they stone to death Stephen, the first deacon of the church, the first Christian martyr in the New Testament. As Saul, he is on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians when he has a vision of Jesus Christ that changes his life. And after his dramatic conversion experience, with Jesus on the Damascus road, Saul becomes a Christian and changes his name to Paul. Now, Saul is his Hebrew, his Jewish name. Paul is his Greek, his Roman name. Saul is a Pharisee who persecute Christians, but after his conversion, to Christianity, he brings the gospel to the Gentiles. Thus, he uses his Roman name, Paul, which is more familiar to his Gentile audience. Now, one of the meanings of the name Paul, the name Paul means, one of them, Paul's, P-A-U-S-E, Paul's, to indicate a change in his life and his mission. And the hymn is singing of the wonderful change that we experience when we have our justifying grace experience that leads to our sanctification, our sanctifying grace process. And the hymn simply says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and gone astray sanctification since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy over my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. And now, as Paul, he becomes an apostle of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul spreads the gospel of Jesus Christ on his three missionary journeys 
throughout Asia Minor and Europe. The Apostle Paul, the church planter who travels more than 10,000 miles and plants at least 14 churches. The Apostle Paul, the great tent maker, the Apostle Paul, a practical teacher and prolific writer who writes almost half of the New Testament with 13 letters, epistles to the early Christian communities. The Apostle Paul, the spiritual mentor to his spiritual son, Timothy. Remember the Apostle Paul gets a glimpse of heaven from God when he says, I know of one who had an experience and he experienced the third heaven. The Apostle Paul who gets a glimpse of heaven from God before his death. Then the Apostle Paul dies as a martyr for his faith by the Romans as his head is cut off on Nero's shopping block. Well, listen, why did you give us all that information on Saul who later becomes Paul? Well, the Apostle Paul narrates the narrative of our pericope. And so therefore, we got the information about Saul and Paul, his background, to authenticate what he is saying, the change in his life. So he narrates the narrative of our pericope. The story really begins in chapter 8. Biblical scholars and theologians say that chapter 8 and chapter 9 go together. So the story begins in chapter 8. Paul organizes an offering for the church in Jerusalem. Now, this is the mother church, but she is poor. And it is Paul's desire that all the Gentile churches should help the church of Jerusalem, the mother church their mother in the faith. So, so Paul uses the example of the church in Macedonia to encourage the church at Corinth to give to help with the needs of the church in Jerusalem. Wow, he encourages, he uses the example of the church in Macedonia to, in, to write to the church in Corinth to encourage them by the example of the church in Macedonia to give to help the church in Jerusalem. Through a poor church, the church in Macedonia, they plead to give to the church in Jerusalem. They plead, they ask, they want to do it, to give to the church in Jerusalem. Friends, do we ever plead to give? Are we willing to give? Are we excited about giving? Or do we just leave it to others? The church in Jerusalem is going through difficult times financially because of the persecution from the Jews who live in Jerusalem. The church in Macedonia hears about the need and they give. They give sacrificially. They give joyfully. They give themselves. And this is the example that Paul shows the church at Corinth. The sacrificially and joyfully and of self, which I'll speak on in a minute, does it define our giving. So Paul appeals to the Christian traits. Paul appeals to the Christian traits that they excel in. Faith, prayer, teaching, evangelism, knowledge, discipleship, love. And then he challenges them to excel also in the grace of giving. Look at verse 7, chapter 8, where Paul says, Since you excel in so many ways, you have so much faith, such gifted speakers, such knowledge, such enthusiasm, 
and such love for us that now I want you to excel also in this gracious ministry of giving. Now fast forward, flip over one chapter to our pericope in chapter 9. Paul gives what we shall call a pep talk. He gives a pep talk. I remember, I thought about this this week, and I don't want to go too far into this. I remember as a, as a, as a high school student in high school, and I don't know if they have them now in the schools, but every week before the football game, the day of, we had a pep rally. Y'all remember the pep rally? And, and at Insula High School, what we did with the pep rally, each class, freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior, when they get turned to each class, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Glory's a little leery that I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it. We, we, they got to each class and to see which class had the school spirit. And they would award a spirit stick for the week to each class. Now, I know I'm dating myself, but y'all rem I remember that. Those pep rallies, they were so much fun. I'm tempted to do it, but I'm not. Now, <laughs> now, so, so Paul is giving a pep talk on giving to the Corinthians. And he encourages the Corinthians to be grateful for what God has done and for what God is doing. And he says the reward for generous generosity is the provision for more generosity. So Paul, Paul says to the Christ followers in the church at Corinth, Paul says the point is this. It's simple. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Everyone should give with whatever they have decided in their heart. They shouldn't give with hesitation and because of pressure. God loves a cheerful giver. God can bless you with everything you need and you will always have more than enough to do all kinds of good things for others. Because they're giving to help others, the church in Jerusalem. Two nuggets I want to look at with this text, and I had many more, but I'm going to narrow it down to two. Two nuggets I want to toss out and I'm through. And the first one, I'm going to go back and forth from last Sunday to this one because I see some parallels. First, when we give, the self becomes the gift. When we give, the self becomes the gift because we must first give self to God. Notice in Paul, the conversion experience gives himself to God, and now he can speak about giving. To be a cheerful giver, yes, it includes money, but it also includes more than money. It means to give of our talents, to give of our time, and to give of our treasure. But most importantly, it means to give self. Friends, if we are to do anything for the kingdom of God, we must first give ourselves to the Lord. The self becomes the gift. A pig and a chicken walk down the road together. And as they walk, they see a sign advertising, promoting a breakfast to benefit the poor. And the chicken says to the pig, you and I should donate a ham and egg breakfast. And the pig says, not so fast. For you, it is just a contribution. But for me, it'll be total commitment. <laughs> it is obvious then that before the church in Macedonia give of their money to the church in Jerusalem, they first give themselves to God. Why else then would they plead? Would they ask to give to the church in Jerusalem? Now, Paul says about the Macedonians, about the church in Macedonia. Chapter 8, verse 5, listen to what Paul says about them. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Even before he talks about all other kinds of giving, Paul says, they gave themselves first to the Lord. 
And this is the message that Paul gives to the church in Corinth. You see, a gift without the giver is bare. So how much of our heart, how much of our lives do we give to God? Friends, how much of our heart and how much of our lives do we give to God? How much of our time, how much of our talents, how much of our treasure do we give to God? And because they first give their heart and their life to God, notice what they do. Church in Macedonia, the Macedonians. Because they first give of themselves, their heart, their lives. Since they first give of themselves, they follow up with their financial gifts to the church in Jerusalem. But we must first give ourselves to God. Songwriter says, give yourself to Jesus. He's waiting just for you. Just put all your trust in him, for God will take care of you. Remember, to give ourselves to God is to renew our commitment to God. It is to release our possession of the self. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. To give ourselves, I like to put it like this, when we give ourselves, to give ourselves is God's purpose over our personal preferences. And to not give the self is selfishness. Because selfishness is cheap grace. It is to want to receive from God, but not to give to God. The German theologian Diedrich Bonhoeffer says, to want God's blessings for free, without cost, without action, is cheap grace. David says, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So we must first give ourselves to God. I mentioned this on last Sunday. Shared it at nine and I share it now. A gospel song by William McDowell is now, underscore now, is now on my playlist favorites. At first, this song did not do it for me. At first, this song did not do it for me. I tried and I tried and I tried to listen to this song but it never did it for me. Did it for Gloria, we talk about it, and she's oh, it's powerful, it's wonderful. So I go back and listen and listen and listen, but the song just never did it for me. But one Sunday, Gloria and I decide to worship at this church, and the choir, you guessed it, they sing this song. <laughs> An older Christ follower, a seasoned saint, sing the lead parts. She has a beautiful, enthusiastic, full of energy, passionate alto voice. And the song speaks to me like never before. It was like she had an experience. Sort of like from Saul to Paul. And Paul can now say this because he has had his Damascus Road experience. What a spiritual experience. They're singing this song, the lady, and while she's singing the lead part, she's smiling. And before I know it, I'm standing up now. I'm saying my amens are getting louder. I'm raising my hand. Let me share you the words. The song simply says, here I am, here I stand. Lord, my life is in your hand. Lord, I'm longing to see your desires revealed in me. I give myself away. Take my heart, take my life as a living sacrifice. All of my dreams, all my plans, Lord, I place them into your hands. For I give 
myself away. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. My life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself to you. I give myself away. And I give myself away so you can use me. So when we give ourselves first to God, when the first gift is ourself to God, what happens? We affirm our trust in God, that we can trust God with our lives. I trust in God wherever I may be, upon the land or on the rolling sea. For come what may from day to day, my Heavenly Father, He watches over me. I trust in God, I know He cares for me. On mountain bleak or on the stormy sea, though billows rose, He keeps my soul. Our Heavenly Father watches over us. And then second and finally, when we give, God gives back to us. You see, God designs it so that when we give, it comes back to us. Ecclesiastes, the 11th chapter, verse 1 says, Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. And another translation puts it like this, Be generous, and someday you will be rewarded. When we give, what happens? God gives it back to us. Listen to Paul in verse 6. Whoever sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And whosoever sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. So when we give, what happens? God gives it back to us. You see, because God is a giver. Sometimes God's blessings are tangible, such as creature comforts. And then sometimes God's blessings are intangibles, such as personal satisfaction and joy. God is a giver. God is a giver. God is a giver. Look at the intangible blessings that often we take for granted, that often we don't think about. It may just be calm nerves. What about the blessing of a peace of mind? What about this blessing that we take for granted? A good night's sleep. Or somebody just to bring us a cold glass of water. God is a giver. And friends, we become like God when we give. I wish I had time to go through Genesis and go through the acts of God and show us God is a giver. God gives. I thought about the little children's son sung this morning on my way. God gave his son. His son gave his life so that we may have a right to the tree of life. So regardless, be it tangible or intangible, God's blessings come back to us when we give. For when we give, we become like God. When we give, we trust God to meet our needs. Because God is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. God is faithful, friends. God will provide. God will meet our needs. I like the way the hymn writer puts it. Great is thy faithfulness. O oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions. They fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All that we need, God, your hand has provided. Because great is your faithfulness, O Lord, unto us. So when we give, God moves to provide for our needs. One more time and I'm through. Look at verse 8. He says, God can bless us with everything we need. 
and we will always, underscore always, have more than enough to do all kinds of good things for others. They're giving to the church in Jerusalem for others. It comes back to us. God moves to provide for our needs. And I don't know how, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but God in some form or fashion gives what we give back to us. How good the Lord is. How faithful is our God. A little boy and his mother are in a drugstore. And there's a jar of candy on the counter. And the manager sees the little boy looking at the candy. And when his mother goes to pay for her items, the manager asks the boy, you want some of this candy? And the boy nods, yes. The manager then says, well, go ahead, get some. But the boy just stands there. Again, the manager says, go ahead and get a handful of candy. But the little boy just stands there. Then the manager reaches into the jar, pulls out some candy. He then gives it to the little boy. And the little boy fills his pockets. And when they get outside the store, his mother asks him, why didn't you get a handful of candy when the man told you it was okay? And the boy says, mama, because his hands are bigger than mine. So what I want to let us know, God's hands are bigger than ours. Bigger so God can be faithful. Bigger so God can provide. Bigger so God can give back to us. God's hands are bigger than ours. Lord, we thank you that you are a giving God. We thank you that you give back to us so that we can trust you to provide and to be faithful to us. Thank you for being our giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, will you stand with us?
so much for the worshipful music. Music ushers us into the presence of God and it prepares our hearts for the preaching of the gospel. And you make it so easy to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you all for the wonderful music. <laughs> Friends, because God is faithful, we can trust him. We can trust him with our lives and we can trust him with our gifts. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, have a great week. Be a blessing to someone. Amen.